I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting tonight uh, on stolen land. No matter where we are in Queensland, um, we are on Aboriginal land. Um, so tonight I'm on the lands of the Yagra and Turbal people here in South Brisbane in the Alliance office. Um, I would encourage each of you to just take a second to write in the chat whose land you're on. So thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Emily Kane. I'm a community organiser with the Queensland Community Alliance. Uh, and we are all here in the final of five uh, civic academies to explore kind of one section of, of policy uh, that we as the Alliance, as organised civil society in Queensland, are taking to a state election um, to negotiate with, our, the, with the parties and our state leaders around. Um, so tonight's session is on welcoming new Queenslanders. Uh, there's a few kind of facets to that, but we'll hear more about that later. I just wanted to take a second to go through uh, some of our objectives this evening. Um, so the objectives of tonight's session are the same as um, all of the Civic Academy's sessions. Um, we want to be able to develop the technical and policy knowledge among alliance leaders and within Alliance institutions. Um, we try not to have passengers on the bus or participants um, or, you know, spectators in our, there's too many analogies here. We want people to be actively engaged in the things that we're negotiating for across our Alliance. Um, and so this is a way of kind of sharing and developing um, the knowledge among Alliance leaders institutions around what we're negotiating for in the lead up to the election. We want to build on our maroon print vision and principles for Queensland reconstruction. So there's a link in the chat um, to the maroon print if you haven't seen it. Um, it's a set of uh, policies and a vision for Queensland that we as the Alliance um, think would be a good idea. Uh, and we also want to increase the ambition and imagination around public policy. So thinking about what, what's in the realm of what's possible, what's needed, and how can we stretch that imagination around excellent public policy in Queensland? The agenda that we've built to kind of meet those aims this evening is that in a moment, I will hand over to Kennedy Shuley. I actually haven't seen him on the call yet. Oh, there you are, Kennedy. Hello. Um, welcome. Um, so Kennedy is uh, from the Queensland African Communities Council and he'll be talking to us about, you know, why, why do we need to have a policy around welcoming new Queenslanders? What are the problems that we're trying to solve here? Um, we, oh, we, sorry, we're going to go into small groups first. We're going to go into small groups and you get to know one another. Then we'll hear from Kennedy. Um, and then we will hear from Cal Ayer from Multicultural Australia and Kerry Woodrow from Multicultural Australia and also Miriam, whose last name I don't know, sorry, Miriam. Aman um, from QPAST, uh, the Queensland Program for, of Assistance for Survivors of Torture and Trauma. Um, I'd like, like to now introduce Kennedy Shuley from the Queensland African Communities Council, who's going to share a bit about um, his community and, and some experiences um, as a migrant in Australia and in, in Queensland. Uh, and so, welcome, Kennedy. Oh, thanks, Emily. I uh, appreciate for the opportunity. And uh, as some of my colleagues that we did meet in the breakup room, I was, um, I told a little bit of a story on how it feels sometimes when you are new to the country, especially when it comes to being in a country, in a place where it's a different, where they have a different culture. But of course it's always appreciated because you gotta learn some new things uh, as, as we grow. But at the same time in the very, early times you get to really face some challenges uh, when it comes to uh, let's say languages, uh, how people express themselves and how things are appreciated, are, are welcomed. All of those kinds of sort of things have been pretty much quite a challenge from both my side as well as other people who have known so far in the country. But uh, we are always glad when we meet uh, in places like this uh, it makes me feel sometimes like it's, um, it's a family. So thank you for that. Uh, when we look to, into our African community, uh, I'd say that there are plenty of challenges at the moment that of course requires attention from different policy or decision makers, as well as uh, service providers. We, we all know that COVID-19 has presented us with a lot of uh, um, 
challenges, but actually outside of COVID-19 still, uh, the community has to, hasn't been really in the very better position as we would imagine. Uh, at the moment, what we come to realize is that most of the people in the community, not only in our community, but rather in the wider Australian community, even service providers sometimes, they there is that failure to understand that there is diversity even in the African community itself. Uh, and when I say diversity, it's, I mean, pretty much really having different cultures and uh, different languages sometimes, uh, because we appreciate the fact that the continent of Africa is huge. So it's not a country, honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's a continent. So therefore you will always expect people like in Europe that there are those who come from England, there are those from France, they will always have different way of expressing themselves as well as uh, different uh, languages that they do share. And in fact, that actually in some African countries, there are those that um, have English that as the official language, but and there are those that have French, Italian, and there are those who have Portuguese as the official language. Again, another burden on top of a burden. But here in Australia, what uh, ch the challenges that we've experienced so far is that it comes to the same point again of languages. With the recent is, uh, incidences of COVID-19, let's say, you found that most of the materials or information that are being developed are not really in those languages. We came together to identify different uh, languages in our communities, of which we presented to different uh, service providers, and some were still really shocked to learn that uh, these languages are spoken by Africans here in Queensland. Uh, and of course, apart from that, not many really were having that mindset of treating people with that diversity in mind. But we still appreciate, of course, always that there is always the intention to see things progressed uh, when we come to, into forums like this ones to identify some of these problems in order to find uh, a solution. Well, as we would imagine, of course, with different incidences, we had a lot of reports as well from our community members, uh, especially when it comes to employment uh, and getting jobs or losing jobs. So, well, I might a bit relate to some American studies, but more I can just talk of the experience of our community members who reported to us. Uh, we found that most of our community members have been losing our jobs easily comparing to their counterparts who are not uh, of African descent. And of course, it's been even much harder when you tend to report or try to fall, uh, pursue maybe a legal action to get that support, to get you into the process to make sure that you are legal, you, you understand the reasoning behind your dismissal, but it becomes even much harder for an African to secure uh, a legal action or to secure justice when it comes to fighting for loss of job. So we have that as a remaining challenge at the moment, and of course, we may not really leave behind uh, issues of uh, uh, education that have been recently uh, experienced by our, our community members. <clears throat> and uh, with a reference to an example of um, uh, recent restrictions or where people were encouraged to do the homeschooling, most of our parents have been really experiencing a lot of financial difficulties. So that's pretty much quite categorized in two different really uh, groups. There is one that they still struggle with the English as a language. There are those parents who still find that themselves as parents are still attending TEF, learning English, doing a course, and they're expected to understand almost everything that even an Australian born person is still, still struggling to understand when an email is sent to them. So those parents are expected to to understand the whole email, go through the passwords and all of those things that are requested from them without any problem. In fact, some of them are really arriving in the country with a zero skill on how to use some of these uh, technological devices. Mm -hmm. Not to say that actually we are undermining the uh, capacity, but of the honesty that there are people who have been in the countries that they didn't get that advantage. They've needed it, they've been wanting it, but unfortunately, uh, the environment didn't allow them to have that uh, uh, that luxury or that opportunity to use uh, some devices. Even for those who arrived with um, a limited knowledge on how to use it, 
you still find even an Australian born child is still really struggling with using uh, some programs on the computer. Emails, I don't think it's always fun for everyone, especially when it's that really kind of, uh, uh, sh the computer starts sh shutting down or requesting you to log in and log off again. So all of those challenges have been pretty much around uh, some of our parents. And of course, let's acknowledge the fact that these devices, even though we are already in Australia, they still need to purchase. Uh, for you as a person to have them, you still need to put some income into that. And now we have this issue that parents are losing their jobs easily. Sorry, and now you found that the same very parent is affected to buy uh, devices for almost 10 kids, eight kids, seven kids, or five, if we really choose to reduce the number to that because uh, most of our family members are really blessed with kids. So, and uh, we tend to have larger families, uh, which we always appreciate, honestly. And of course, I understand that some family members in Australia still have the same way, but we do have different uh, ways uh, to access our income. And of course, that privilege still kicks in for some individuals that are still not enjoyed by some of the African community members. So, Finance has been a very tough uh, thing for our family members because they can't afford all the devices for all, everyone to have access to them. Unfortunately, again, though, that most of our parents or community members who have been experiencing those issues that have attended even to teachers to see, to give them feedback and to seek support in order to see how they can understand some of these requests that they're being sent. Unfortunately, uh, I can still say that some of our members reported to us that they've been denied even that opportunity to express themselves in that way. But if you look otherwise, uh, and I think that's where it comes also even the issue of mental health. When you look otherwise, another parent with the same very child or the same age in the same school, coming to the school, asking for the same very request, but being a different race, uh, that person is uh, that parent is given the opportunity to express themselves. Uh, that parent is given the table to put uh, to to share whatever concern they have about their child. And of course, all the directions are provided easily without any concern. But for members of our communities, they ought to be labeled first for them to get the services that they need. They ought to be challenged a little bit in order for them to get whatever they need. So some of these are, may seem smaller for the, for the one who's pretty much providing the service because they may not be in the shoes of that individual, but really that's impacts on someone else's mental health because once these parents go home, they will face challenges with their kids because kids will always observe what is happening. How is their parent being treated? and then they can cope with it some way they're going to treat their parents and of course let's acknowledge the fact that loss of job regardless whether it be african or not it has always been linked to the issues of mental health so now imagine a person of which now i know that most of the service providers when we they provide services they just look back from the earlier years that the person arrived with um, a trauma or all of those kind of things they experienced this and that in their country and they will just base only on that as the only issue that these uh, individuals have but it really goes beyond that some of the other mental health issues are really caused right here how people are getting treated uh what are the issues that they're experiencing here and of course that right there also comes the uh issue of accessing services Sorry, Kennedy, you've got 30 seconds left. Uh, 30 seconds? Yeah, or a minute if you need it. Oh, sweet. Sorry, and then maybe as if we jump really to just secure these 30 seconds, we'll just quickly jump into domestic violence. You found that domestic violence is still a very big issue in our community, but unfortunately, most people are not really seeking uh, support because they are fearing to lose opportunities. They're fearing to lose their loved ones. They are even not having that strong trust anymore with the justice uh, departments or with those who will be sitting in between to provide the support they claim to be providing to them. So you found that most of our community members may no longer really trust an institution to go and report to them because they know I will be exposed with a very good evidence. Now at the moment that these two girls who experienced um, 
who had COVID-19, we had a lot of trust with different departments that they're going to really help us. They're going to treat us as any other people. But unfortunately, what happened was exposing their uh, names through the media, leaking their information with a very uh, derogative uh, title that is even given to a person who is a traitor, enemies of the state. So putting yourself in that circumstance, being your child, I don't really know how that you would cope with that. But we had already uh, something to compare with. We had exactly two girls again of a different race, the same crime, but never been exposed. So you found that all of these things are still kicking in and challenging us, of course, telling the whole Australia uh, community that there is still a lot of work for us to do in order to address our issues and matters that are currently affecting our communities. Well, there are plenty of issues, but to save time, let's agree that any question can still come in. I will appreciate for that. Thank you so much, Kennedy. I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, no I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on and I, I think it's not easy, which is why we're all here to, to kind of figure it out together. Um, I'd like, like to now uh, invite um, some of our Alliance leaders, some more Alliance leaders, um, Kerry Woodrow and Cal Ayers and Miriam, um, to share some of the proposed solutions that we, uh, as the Alliance, are advocating for in the lead up to the election. Um, I've got some slides that I will share with the policy asks on them. Thanks, Emily. Um, first of all, I just Kerry, you, we heard you for about a second, but now you're on mute. It just muted me. Oh, 2020, the year of, are you on mute? <laughs> um, so I just want to thank uh, Kennedy so much uh, because, uh, you know, we can bring from uh, the perspective of, of, as he spoke about service providers and people who have worked in the company communities, uh, Kennedy has a really amazing insight as a person with lived experience, but also as a person uh, who has worked, you know, really hard with his community and has worked in within the systems uh, that we're that we're wanting to influence. So he has a really uh, amazing insight in these spaces. So thanks so much, Kennedy. Uh, and and I just want to reiterate what Kennedy said. Um, the 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 special the specific um, ask within our Maroon plan, um, particularly around New Queenslanders, is. Um, is about acknowledging that some of the unique challenges that um, that that some of our, that our unique that our um, new Queenslanders face, but also about acknowledging that unless um, people who come here as refugees and asylum seekers uh, and migrants have the opportunity to really um, contribute the skills and experiences that they bring to really be able to participate socially, economically, culturally, um, we're all less. We're all lesser as, as a community and we're all lesser as Queenslanders. So the, the asks that we bring tonight are um, as much about um, supporting communities that face really quite unique and specific challenges, but also recognising the unique and specific um, uh, qualities and strengths and wisdoms that, that our, our new Queenslanders bring and that if we just open up the spaces, we have all the opportunity to uh, benefit from. So I'm going to ask uh, Miriam to speak to us first about um, uh, workers' rights. Thanks, Miriam. Okay. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, everyone, um, for really your insightful um points that you've made so far. So one of the asks that we're um, looking for um, is workers' rights um, for um, education for new Queenslanders. And the reason this is really, really um, key and important is as um, Carrie and, and everyone else mentioned that when we, when most migrants, refugees, people that are new come to Australia, they actually do not know what safety net um, and what rights they have and what safe and lawful employment looks like. So that means that they're really open to being exploited um, and which leaves them in this very precarious position of really needing to work, wanting to settle, trying to become, you know, um, a part of the society, uh, but also at the same time not knowing if things go wrong, um, 
what are their rights, what should they do, who can assist them, um, and you know, this can be very detrimental. In some cases, people do take on employment where they end up getting hurt. Um, in some cases, people do get exploited uh, quite severely to the point where their mental health is impacted um, and they're unable to work again or um, have physical um, uh, disabilities as a result of that. And uh, at times are unable to even get things like workers' compensation or uh, work cover um, because uh, at the beginning, there was nobody there to help them digest the information in the right language and give them access to the information and reassure them that, yes, um, you, you do have those rights. Uh, and that might not be the case from um, uh, in other places, but that is certainly the case in Australia. And I think that gives people the confidence to feel safe um, and to seek um, good employment and not be exploited, really, in short. Um, with that, um, the other thing I really just wanted to touch upon is also the fact that the, this has a flow on effect on people's families. Um, psychologically, their children are impacted. Uh, families aren't able to afford the necessities of life. Um, very often, it also really scars them from accessing other types of employment. It impacts their self-esteem. Um, and there's a lot of, and it can also be very triggering for people uh, when they've already come from a, um, um, a place where there was a lot of strife and trauma that they'd experienced prior to their arrival in Australia. Um, so yes, it seems like a very simple ask, but yes, education, uh, information, um, and in that way would be very helpful. So um, that's all I got to say. <laughs> Thank so, you, Mary. I'm back to Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. Over to you, Cal. Thanks. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity today. So I'll take over um, the other two asks on the um, package that we have for new Queenslanders. I might start with the um, piece around the digital inclusion and digital education because um, Kennedy spoke quite eloquently. He really um, brought all those examples to life, what we've seen through this pandemic. And it's not a particularly um, an issue that's with... Um, New, for new Queenslanders, but it just this pandemic just highlighted the divide that exists, this digital divide. And we're talking in terms of a double divide now. It's, it's not just the affordability, you know, the act, having the devices or the data. It's also negotiating that cultural capital. How do people have the ability and the skills to negotiate what is actually being asked of us in, the, in these times? We knew before the pandemic that things going online would be an issue for um, newly arrived communities who might probably have issues with um, literacy, language issues. And if services are more and more moving online, that would pose significant challenges. And then the pandemic came along and it really highlighted what we've really um, tried to articulate over this um, period of time. With the schooling for children for um, call families, it was really, poignant because the families who um, they perhaps arrived as new Queenslanders have struggled as maybe refugees, asylum seekers now really looking forward to have their children enrolled in school and then faced with the prospect now of children missing school, missing out on what they thought of things moving online. So that was a acute problem that we face. And as an ask towards this particular issue, we there are two parts to this ask. One is to um, have the accessible devices for children in schools if there's a second wave of pandemic that could be um, identified very easily in schools with high needs that are uh, for children who need those devices that would be one but the second um, piece of that ask would be around digital education for families um, this would be through community organizations and supporting people in acquiring some of that capital and how do we negotiate this whole online culture that is visited upon us. It's not just schooling now, more and more your health services are moving online, mental health services, telehealth appointments are becoming quite commonplace, but also um, just accessing services Australia, for example. So these are, this is a two part ask. So how can we best support new Queenslanders uh, negotiating this whole new world that has now uh, moved increasingly online? So that was, the, um, that was the first ask around the digital inclusion um, that became really apparent with the COVID. But there's another different ask uh, that I'm going to speak to. It's called um, supporting a, a group of people who are um, labor.
sorry, I think I pressed mute, apologies. Um, so this is about supporting this group of asylum seekers. Now there is this um, group of asylum seekers who treat it um, slightly differently to other asylum seekers in Australia, just by an arbitrary date of arrival. They call the um, legacy cohort. It's, and their process of um, status determination for asylum in Australia has followed a very um, different trajectory. So people do their primary application and then uh, if they have uh, failed through um, their primary application and the review process now are in the community. Um, they don't really have any significant support. So we're talking about um, individuals, that's men, women and children who are currently in Queensland and they're called the finally determined cohort. So the messaging around this group of people has been actually quite stark that they, they really have no options of support now. They have exhausted their asylum seeking options, but their real option is um, really deportation or facing destitution in Australia. So with the pandemic, obviously with the border closures, the returning home is not an option, but it's not just about a border closure. It's also about people not really being able to safely return where they originally arrived from. So this is now a really um, vulnerable and destitute cohort and a specific group of people here um, who are seeking our support in Queensland. So this particular ask is really requesting the state government to um, provide support for people who are determined in, to be in this cohort for a short period of time, just making sure that there is some um, level of payment of financial support available to them but also because they've been uh, pulled out of any um, support programs just to make sure that they have adequate health care, especially in these times. And also ensuring there is appropriate education available for the school age children as they go through this whole process of negotiating their future, really. So these were the two other uh, main asks um, as part of the new Queenslanders package. So now I'm going to hand over to Kerry for the final ask around the domestic and family violence. <clears throat> Thanks, Cal. Um, I think that uh, with with all of these asks, um, there there is something about how we um, how we partner with New Queenslanders and partner with New Queenslander communities to um, you know to to find a, a better future for all of us. The in the space of domestic and family violence, it's it's no less this. And so for the last um, a few years, we've been talking with cultural communities about domestic and family violence, which is an issue that impacts all communities, regardless of cultural background. Um, for domestic for cult communities, there are um, there are you know again unique and specific pressures around forced migration experiences and in intersections around um, race and uh, and class uh, as, as well as gender, which are all issues around domestic and family violence. Um, and what we found is that communities are really, um, and community leaders are really committed to trying to find ways to address and prevent domestic and family violence in their communities because they have done everything that they can to get their families here safely and what they want is for their families to live here together safely with dignity and so um, what we know that we need to do in this space and what we've heard really strongly from communities and from um, mainstream services is to work in partnership with communities um, to address um, and prevent domestic and family violence in cult communities. And we need to actually start resourcing that um, because so much of what cult, culturally and linguistically diverse communities do is volunteer in their spare time on top of their work, on top of their family, on top of everything. And we start, need to start resourcing into those spaces um, to acknowledge, um, to both help to uh, skill up um, leaders and active community members to be active in this role, to really grow the connections with mainstream services so that mainstream services are able to respond in culturally appropriate ways that really support survivors of domestic and family violence. Um, and so this ask is about some re committed ongoing resourcing to actually resource culturally and linguistically diverse communities to be partners with us in addressing and 
um, and preventing domestic and family violence. We know that too often culture is used as an excuse for violence or is, is blamed for violence. And what we want to do is work with communities to really tap culture as a strength in creating healthy and safe families and communities. Um, and so that is what this ask is about, is actually uh, putting money where mouth is to, um, to bring culturally and linguistically diverse communities on board as partners in this work. Thank you so much, Kerry and Cal and Miriam uh, for that. And Kennedy also. <clears throat> so I guess um, the, the kind of, these four elements that we've put together as one one package around uh, a welcoming new Queenslanders package in our in our asks. Um, sorry, I'm David Kennedy. I'm the lead organizer of the Queensland Community Alliance. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, um, so we put together these four elements in into the one package. I think in terms of just how we um, approach the assembly and um, how the for you, for you guys to know for the conversations that you might have with the people that are inside your organization. I'd say that we, uh, you know, are fairly unlikely to get um, all of them from both parties. And we probably will have like different areas within the four that we're making um, more likely to make progress on with different parties. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, I, I, if, if people are interested, I can go into a little bit more of that um, about the meetings that we've we've had recently and, and how that's looking. But I think probably the, the main thing is, you know, we're, we're putting forward what we think is are the best solutions um, and, and the best ways to respond to these issues. And then we negotiate them. And it's been the same with each of the, the previous civic academies and the, the policy areas that we've put forward there. Um, you know, just because they're in our ask doesn't mean we'll get them entirely. Um, uh, so um, I think just being aware of that and, and helping then the people that you talk to, to understand that and understand where we might have the opportunity to get to out of our negotiation during the assembly. The, in the assembly, um, we'll, we'll do our introduction and our roll call to show the diversity of who's there. Um, and then in the, the kind of second part of it, we'll be hearing stories and then solutions for safe and connected communities. So the three um, issue areas sitting under that around welcoming new Queenslanders, around community centre funding and around social isolation. Um, and then we'll, 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 we'll hear the similar stories and then solutions in relation to our real jobs for a real future area. So the stories around climate, um, and energy um, and uh, and jobs and so um, and we'll hear the hear the the quick the, the short versions of briefings in relation to those so these are kind of two minute distillations of briefings of the the type of things that we've worked through you know for an hour or, or more each um, and then and then we'll have the the uh, premier and then the opposition leader. I'm not sure yet in which order um, each get up and we'll have about 25 minutes where we um, where we um, ask them about which of these that they can commit to um, and then we'll come back through that list so the the co-chairs who are, who are running that will come back through that list and try and get firm commitments you know, clarity on whether they're the yes or a no in relation to them. Um, but as well as yeses and noes, we're also um, keen to get a, a more nuanced sense of where a commitment might li lie in their priority order, you know, um, and where if they're saying no, well, what, what are the objections and are, are they are they technical? Are they political? If they're political, what can we do to help change the the equation. Um, so, look, we we're not we, we're we're about to start role playing with our um, chairs around how we do that negotiation. We've never had that as much, quite as much nuance to that in in the way we've done it before. And so, um, I guess we're giving a, a little bit of a, a, a peek behind the curtain in a way that I'm not sure if we'll pull that off. But that's what we're going to be working towards 
Um, so I guess there's, there's two things that usually happen. We kind of, um, on one hand could be too narrow, like just yes and no, but without any substance and nuance and sophistication to it. Or at the other extreme, we could be too vague and we're not really clear if, if someone's saying that they're going to do it or not and in what time frame they're going to do it and how much money they're going to put into it and all those kind of things, right? And so we're, we're actually trying to cover both of those bases and, and actually have a, a fairly significant back and forth between our co-chairs and the Premier or Alternative Premier around um, their commitments, you know, over, over about 20 minutes. So obviously the guts of the negotiation, a lot of it is done beforehand. Um, you know, but it's that it's that last ten percent of things that where they're saying, "Oh yeah, look, we're interested in that, but I couldn't tell you if we'd get it over the line, or we we might want to uh, we'll we'll take that under consideration or whatever." That actually having a thousand people there or eight hundred people somewhere in that range uh, really makes the difference um, versus when there's a couple of us sitting in a room with them. Um, so I guess that's uh, it's that last ten percent. That's that's the that that's the area that'll be negotiated on on the night. So we'll probably know the things they're definitely saying no to. We'll know the things they're definitely saying yes to, and there'll be a few things in the middle where where we're still hopeful, and we'll see whether we get them over the line. So thank you all for joining us tonight, and um, a bunch of you have been joining um, every week for the past five weeks. So thank you all for being a part of these academies. Um, I'll send around a link to all of the recordings and the policy um, asks probably tomorrow. Um, and other than that, I think that's a wrap. So thank you all for being part of this. And I will see you all with everyone you know uh, on the 14th of September. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you all there. Bye. 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 Bye.